Ryan Sands, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tiba. Yeah, really good to to finally be chatting. Yeah, we've been trying to organize this for a while, but you've been busy. So maybe let's let's start there. You're fresh off uh, the completion of a truly incredible adventure, the circumnavigation of Lesotho, which I'll let you explain, but it seems like a tiny mountainous African country. The effort took a full 16 days. You're now a few days removed from finishing. So maybe just first tell us how you're feeling after such a heroic effort. Yeah, definitely pretty, pretty tired still. I think more just uh, legs and stuff seem to have, have bounced back or haven't actually run since then, but just like generally feeling feeling pretty tired and, and uh, yeah, kind of, I guess, like mentally pretty beat up. Um, yeah, the challenge, um, like Rainer and, and I, the, the kind of idea or thinking behind it was to circumnavigate Lesotho, as you mentioned, it's kind of a, it's actually a country within South Africa. It's pretty small, but it's like a, like a landlocked country within South Africa, but it's super mountainous. Whenever I go and try and do mountain training, I always head out to Lesotho or, or the Drakensberg Mountains. So um, there are a lot of peaks there, like kind of uh, 3,300 meters um, kind of plus. So um, yeah, pretty, some fun mountains there. Um, but yeah, so our, our concept was to circumnavigate Lesotho is um, 1,100 Ks. Um, and the elevation, I think, was just over 33,000 meters. Like, I guess it's not that much on, on paper, but like the terrain in Lesotho is just, they're not, they're, like the mountain section, there were just no trails, nothing yeah. super I mean, remote. It, man, it's still a lot. I mean, 1,100 kilometers and 33,000 meters of climbing in 16 days is a lot. So, you know, don't, uh, don't take anything away from yourself. <laughs> How many no, days felt, ago was it that you finished? Yeah, it was, it was about five days ago. So yeah, pretty, still, still pretty recent in, in, in the memory. Um, and yeah, it took us like 16 days, um, weather conditions were brutal. Like yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we picked a good weather window to do it in or so we thought, um, but unfortunately it hasn't stopped raining in Lesotho <laughs> since December. Yeah. yeah, we got we got snow, ice, rain, like everything. So yeah, it was it was a proper adventure. Well, we'll go into all the details, and I was going to definitely ask you to explain the weather conditions because it seemed like it was a constant, never-ending challenge to navigate the cold, wet, miserable <laughs> weather yeah. of those mountains there. But we'll use that as a tease for later on our conversation. I wanted to kind of start uh, at a point in our careers that was sort of special for both of us in a time when we first met. And uh, I want to recall for the audience back in 2011, the Leadville 100. It was a, a special day for both of us. So let's start there. What do you remember from that part of your career and from that day in particular? Jeez, I remember kind of looking over, over my shoulder for a good, good 20, 30 miles to see, to see where you were. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, like an epic day for, for both of us when it was like way back in, in 2011 feels like a complete eternity, eternity now, but, um, yeah, I guess it was, was my hundred miler debut. Um, I think it was your, your second hundred miler. Um, and I, yeah, I think the event is, is obviously really really special um and yeah i was was pretty pretty brutal out out there um i think i remember running around the lake at the end um i'm trying to think who oh, it was josh corn that was um pacing me and i kept like i kept hearing things and i, and I thought it was you and your pacer kind of right up behind me but um i was actually just just hearing things yeah. And you won the race, man. Your first hundred miler at the Leadville 100 coming all the way from South Africa. And it was an exciting time in the sport because it was sort of the first time when things were starting to internationalize where this great South African champion came over to small little podunk Leadville, Colorado to compete in this, you know, legendary though, small race in the greater context of endurance sport. And uh, it launched you into, you know, the next stratosphere of your career. And I remember actually, I don't know if you remember this, but when you sort of took the lead, it was when we were going outbound and starting to climb up Hope Pass, if memory serves correctly. And I remember you and I were running together and you were just behind me. 
and we were hiking up the uh, the pass, and you said something to the effect of, you know, can I get around you? Basically, get get out in front of me and whoever else we were running with. And I remember you saying, "I'm going to be brave here." <laughs> and you just started <laughs> tiptoeing up the pass, just jogging while the rest of us were hiking, and you sort of uh, maintained the lead for the rest of the race and went on to uh, win the Leadville 100. But you know, I think. Uh, for people who are newer to the sport, they may not remember how you got your start in trail running, you know, doing the multi-day stuff, which I think provided abilities that have carried over into things like the Navigate Lesotho project that you just completed. So you're obviously a longtime international figurehead of the sport, but for those who weren't around in 2008, 2009 era, era maybe provide a reminder as to how you got your start in the sport, because it's a little different from the uh, traditional path that a lot of the new up and coming pros have, have taken in their careers. Yeah. So I, I guess to kind of rewind all the way back to, to the start, um, I never kind of grew up wanting to, to run. Um, I never did that, did athletics at, at school or university. I played a, played a lot of rugby and then kind of surfed in high school. And it was only like last year at university that I did a, did a marathon um, actually really enjoyed it. And then one thing led to another, did a couple of local trail races. And then I remember like one Sunday, just Googling extreme trail races and I popped the, the four deserts website. Um, I was like, kind of got pretty hooked on, on running and I just read Dean Conaz's book and I was like, geez. Um, and I saw that he was actually, doing the race I wanted to do the Gobi desert race. And I was like, cool, like kind of this, this must be it. And yeah, before I knew it, um, I'd entered the race and kind of, yeah. Um, went out there, didn't actually even know where the Gobi desert was, had to do a bit of kind of Googling and, and checking, checking it out. Um, and, and yeah, kind of got, the, I guess that's how I got into kind of the sport of, of ultras. But I think for me, like rewinding all the way back and why I like done projects like Navigate Lesotho, et cetera, I've always loved that. Like I enjoy performance, but also just like love the adventure going out there and seeing new places, trying new things, seeing if it is possible. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's our four, four deserts is definitely where, where it all started for me in, in 2008. Has that changed at all as you've gotten older and sort of as you're, motivation has changed or as you've ticked some of your things off the off the bucket list are you now more drawn towards things like navigate lesotho than you are towards a race like leadville anymore or do you still find a similar balance in terms of motivation for racing and adventure i think i've always tried to like i guess have that that, that balance but if if I guess like now five days out from, from Navigate Lesotho, I'm like, flip, I'm never, I'm never doing anything like that again. I just want to race. Um, but I guess like you probably the same, like we've been in the sport for, for a long time. Like, um, I still kind of love racing and pushing myself, but there's only like, I guess a handful of races, to be honest, that really kind of get me motivated. Um, and I guess if you're running a hundred Ks or hundred miles, like you, you got, you got to pick the the races that kind of, get you stoked and get you amped and to get out there and do the training so i definitely see myself doing like more adventures um as well i, I love the sport and, and i want to like stay in it as as long as possible um and, and mix it up so yeah i'm definitely kind of trying to find that 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 balance between adventure and racing but i, I guess if I look back the last couple of years, I haven't like raced that much. Um, I yeah. guess kind of post Western States in 2017, um, definitely kind of, yeah, done a bit kind of less racing, more, more projects, but I'm, I'm enjoying like that, 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 that balance. Yeah. It's funny. I was having a similar conversation with some up and coming younger American pros. I was in Boulder, Colorado last week. And one of them asked me sort of like, what do you still want to do competitively as a yeah. professional? And I sort of had this, a similar answer and that there's really only a few things I still want to do, um, on the racing front. Right. And yeah. two of them are go back to hard rock and go back to yeah. UTMB two races that I've done, but that I would love to do again and give full focus to full of attention and energy to, 
at least one more time in my career. But aside from that, you know, I feel like I've done so much and it's such a gift and there's so many great things to do now, but you do have to kind of follow that intuition and like what actually speaks to you to give you the, uh, the energy, the motivation to actually put in the training that we know is necessary to be successful. You and I both come from non-running backgrounds. You just talked about how you were playing rugby and only got into running after sort of uh, university. Do you view that as an advantage in like how successful you've been in your career or do you view it as a disadvantage or do you feel like it's maybe been a little bit of both at different times? Just coming from a different background, I mean. Yeah. Jeez, I, I think I'd like to see it as, as an advantage, just like being, like, I guess, like, if you look at both of us, we've been in, in the sport probably kind of one of the longest out of out of most of of the kind of, you want to call it the such, the kind of the, the professional at or kind of trail runners that have been in, in the sport. So I, I think kind of coming into the sport completely fresh and just kind of, being excited the whole time and just like learning like stuff the whole time. I, th- I think for me, what's always kind of motivated me and, and driven me is, is to kind of keep improving. Um, and like, I think if, if I hit that, that, that ceiling, uh, definitely from, from a racing point of view, um, yeah, I'd, I'd probably lose the, the passion and, and stoke. So I think it's definitely been an ad- advantage. Um, I think both of us, like haven't come in from like kind of, years and years or kind of from school level of kind of doing cross country and track and and, and training for, for me, it's just felt like completely fresh and something new. And, and I guess also in, in the early years, just being able to progress really quick, quickly is something that, that kind of, I kind of enjoyed and, and kind of definitely motivated me to, to keep on keeping on. Yeah. That's so yeah, exactly my trajectory too. even going back to reading Dean Karnaz's book and born to run. That was the era that we came up in. And as a lacrosse player, yeah, finding running and coming into it with this natural competitiveness or just the knowledge of how to compete and at least some semblance of fitness from a lifelong, you know, devotion to athletics just allowed me to be you know, have the focus and energy and yeah, will to do the training that was necessary. But then, like you said, when you start to see that improvement early in your career becomes so addicting. And I think for both of us, you know, coming from that team sport field sport background, it was, and coming into the sport when we did, it provided just like the perfect trampoline from which we could build awesome careers within this, this growing sport. It's now May of 2022, which means we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of your first running of Western States. It was also, also my first yes. running of Western States in 2012. Wow. Also a race that I view as really significant, a really important moment in your career and in the sport in general. I guess, again, for those who are newer, maybe provide a summary for what happened that day and and uh, what do you remember from it as we approach the 10-year anniversary? Jeez, yeah, that was yeah, 20, 2012 when when Timothy Olsen obviously said that insane, insane time. Um, yeah, I remember the race like starting off quite quite slowly. The conditions weren't, weren't great initially. I remember getting, I was like pretty, pretty cold and um, it was it hideous was that day. It was yeah. so nasty. At least no, it was like, a, yeah, like 40 miles. Yeah. I couldn't like my hands had like complete, like I thought Western States was, it was a hot race. I didn't like <laughs> never anything. My hands completely froze up. I couldn't even kind of squeeze my, my soft floss to, to drink anything. Couldn't open any, any gels, but um, yeah, I think it was after about 40, 40 miles. I think I remember catching up to, I think it was yourself, Mike Wolf. Timothy Olsen. Um, Dave Mackey to was in the group. Dave Mackey, yeah. Nick Clark was with us, Nick, I think. Nick Clark, yeah. yeah. And All the old ca- school legends, yeah. Yeah, no, it was good, good, good times. And yeah, I remember you were running and then I think it um, kind of came into into Forest Hill. I was in second place and, and to me was was just ahead. And I was one of the, the Cull Street aid stations that – I ran in and, and he was sitting, sitting down. Like I think Hal Kuna, Kuna was um, pacing him and he looked dead and 
dead and buried. Like I was like, this dude is not, not, not getting off that chair. Um, and I was like, flip high fives, like a little bit of a repeat of, of Leadville here. Like I'm in, I'm in, in the lead. I'm, I'm styling. I can kind of pull this, this, this off. And then I think it was about five minutes, five miles later. Um, I just like heard like this, I thought it was like a wild animal behind me. Like there's these kind of, kind of sounds, (laughs) Um, and I looked, looked over my shoulder and there was Timmy just like, again, just saying, sorry, can you, can you move over? And he just kind of steamed past. Um, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like I was feeling really, really good that day to me still, that's like the best I've ever felt in a hundred mile. I, I never really had any low moments. Um, just everything clicked. Um, but like every aid station, I thought like flip, I've got to, I've got to be catching Timmy and I got, got the splits and I was always like one minute like further and further until um just couldn't couldn't catch him at 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 the, or not that I couldn't catch him like he pulled he pulled away I yeah, think he was yeah. about 16 17 minutes ahead and, and broke the the course record but yeah it was a pretty magical day um and I think also like in hindsight just so so stoked for for Timmy I think that definitely kind of was a in his his career definitely a, like a, a defining defining moment and an insane performance it was defining for both you guys. I think it was defining yeah. for the sport too, because it was only a couple of years after the unbreakable year where Jeff yeah. Rose famously caught Anton Kropichka late in the race. And then all of a sudden, Timmy breaks Jeff Rose's record by like 25 minutes or something. And you ran faster than Jeff Rose. I think you finished in just over 15 hours, which still is one of the faster times ever at that race. Did that experience kind of give you the drive and confidence that you needed to ultimately win that race, which you ultimately did five years later in 2017? Yeah, definitely. It was, it was a long, long journey and, and process. Um, I think to be honest, probably being like pretty young in, in the sports, I was like, flip, if I can get, get second, like I'm sure I can come back the following year and make some changes and, and get pretty close to, to winning it. Um, and actually got injured just, just before kind of bust my ankle just before the race, the following, right. the following year. And then, yeah, the kind of, you had had one or two, not, not so great years, got like a stomach bug, the kind of two nights before the the race, I think the same, same year you ended up getting a, a stomach bug as, as well. Um, yeah. And then finally came, gave, gave it a break for one year and then, then finally came back in, in 2017 and, um, yeah, managed to have that that dream day and and win the race. But I, yeah, I think in hindsight, like looking back at my career, I'm I'm kind of really glad it happened that way. I think it was such a like an amazing journey, and and to finally kind of pull it off after like five years of of, of trying was was really special. Yeah, but do you view your second place finish to Timmy as maybe a better performance than? your victory in 2017, obviously the conditions couldn't be more different between the two of those races. 2012 was like you said, cold and rainy at the start, but ultimately a fast day. We saw the record broken. We saw Ellie Greenwood set their women's record that year, which still stands and nobody's come. Nobody's really challenged that record. Of course, the men's record has now been broken a few times, but then in 2017, it was like crazy hot and you guys had wild snow in the high country. When you compare the two performances, you just mentioned that 2012 was maybe your best hundred miler of all time. How does your victory on the Western States course compare? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a hard question to, to answer. Like, as I said, 2012, it, like things just clicked. It seemed to go like pretty smoothly. It's obviously a long time ago, but I, I can't remember any really kind of bad patches. Um, I remember Dean Leslie of Wandering Fever was, was out there filming and I kept asking him like, how's, how's Timmy doing? And Dean, Dean's pretty honest with me. And I could just see by the look on his face, like kind of Timmy was, was pulling, pulling away. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then like in, in 2017, like I'd, I ran a, I ran a smart, a smart race and, and felt like, um, uh, I think I did, I did all the things right, but I definitely kind of buried myself properly, um, out there, especially those last 30, 40 miles. Um, I remember passing, 
passing gym and it was almost like it was quite a similar place to to where Timmy passed me um, or kind of that kind of Carl Street area and I was like just again looking over my shoulder the whole time I was like flip just don't don't let anyone come come <laughs> yeah. past me I remember Alex Nicholas was kind of um, he wasn't too far behind me um, so I definitely like I buried myself that last 20 30 miles I remember the river crossing kind of I just kind of went straight through the river I didn't I made the mistake of not really kind of cooling off getting, yeah I was just like I didn't want anyone to see me because I actually like about a mile or so before the river I was kind of probably pushing a bit hard and I actually kind of completely overheated a bit but I didn't want like anyone to see me or anyone's crew to see that I was kind of a bit out of it um and then kind of got to got to the top and then I think it's Green Gate and then um it took me about five miles to turn things around but yeah I was I was yeah I was definitely like I was out of it by the by the end of 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 the race so yeah maybe maybe 2012 was a was a better was a better, better race well what a it poetic, definitely felt it felt like a, a better race what a poetic coincidence that you passed jim in roughly the same spot that timothy passed you in 2012 and then you were able to hang on this time five years later to finally get that cougar trophy for your sh- your your shelf um yeah. So we both came up in the era of the sport that had a ton of issues with overtraining and over racing, especially. And we've always sort of sent text messages back and forth between the two of us over the years, kind of bouncing ideas off of each other with the emphasis on, you know, how we can stay at the top of our game and be moderate in our racing volume and intelligent with the way that we execute our careers. And it's always been a valuable exchange for me, but I figured it it might be good for the two of us to kind of uh, explore this subject a little bit because you referenced earlier the fact that a lot of the guys that we kind of came up with in that era of the sport have struggled and many of whom, you know, have never really, you know, recovered from some of that overtraining, over racing. How do you think about your own career longevity? Like, how do you think you've been able to be in the sport at such a high level for such a long time? Yeah, I guess like having listened to to you speak a bit and obviously kind of bouncing some ideas um, off you too, I, I guess the kind of one thing we probably both have in common is that we kind of probably quite lazy in, in some ways. Like I think we're both comfortable just to after a race to, to chill out like even kind of after navigate the suit to like I'm pretty comfortable to to take a take a month off and completely recover um we are guessing like kind of the the early years definitely kind of I, I think the sport has progressed to a level now where guys are more cautious um but I, I think kind of in the early days I think the problem is just it's such a new sport so many opportunities um you just want to make make the most of it like um like if you're from from the US and you get a chance to race in in Europe and everything's covered um like in that that, that area you you were going to go for it um and it for me it was like I guess at times quite hard to say no to stuff but uh, I'm glad I, I did and I think for me it was always just important to to kind of spread the the racing out like kind of pick two maybe three key races a year um and I guess probably like also in in the early years, maybe we were lucky that like there were some races that we didn't always have to race flat out. I think like now, like any race you do, it's just like kind of balls to the wall. Like there's, there's there's no, there's no easy international race where I think probably both could say like kind of been lucky in kind of early years where maybe there were one or two easy races, but yeah, I think kind of longevity definitely kind of, spreading out the races, like mixing it up with some, some projects as well, taking some, some downtime. Um, and I think most important keeping like mentally fresh. I think like we can see like there are a lot of guys that have come and gone in, in the sport um, and maybe it's through like injuries or overtraining, but I think also just kind of keeping that, that, that mental stoke um, and enjoying the, the sport and also just like mixing, mixing it up. I, I think we've been, been kind of lucky enough to to kind of have the, those opportunities to do some to do some different things is there ever been a moment where you've felt that you stepped over the line or you did too much because I think there's definitely a few moments in my career where I have and I think we do have a similarity in our 
personalities where we like the the downtime. And I have actually received a lot of compliments from fellow pro athletes on the circuit for my ability to turn it off and stop being an athlete and uh, hopefully, you know, have a longer career as a result. Have there ever been moments where you stepped over the line? And maybe if so, what did you learn from it? Yeah, definitely. Like thinking back, probably 2014, the first year of the the Ultra Trail World Tour. Um, Yeah, I think like obviously you did Trans Grand Canaria early on in the year um, and won that. And then all of a sudden you kind of kind of leading the 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 points and you're like flip now now I've got to chase this tour and the next minute you're doing ultra trail mount fuji and then it was like western states and then I was and like, then you, oh, but you I... did the drakensberg that year too i remember which was yeah exactly a hundred mile which, thing yeah and then I, I guess you just kind of get like in this little bubble i was like ah, oh, like 210k so drakensberg it'll be great training like i'm sure i'll be fine to do ultra trail mount fuji three weeks later and you just like you can, you can get get away with it for a certain amount of time, but by the end of the year, I also got married that year. Like you know, like there's like a lot of stress that goes into that. And by by the time the kind of the end of the year came, I also did a, another like racing the planet race. And um, there was one in Madagascar. I just kind of and I kind of went all in that that year. And um, mm-hmm. and come the end of 2014, well, I actually managed to get through 2014. It was kind of early 2015. I started training again. I think I only took like two or three weeks off. Um, I was like, um, yeah, I just am to, to get back into things. And then all of a sudden just kind of the wheels came off. Um, and I, I picked up glandular fever and mononucleosis. I think, um, and I was like, oh, I can shake that off like in a few weeks. And then I was like a month or two months later, just like, just like, I wasn't like shaking it off. And then it got so bad where like I was struggling to get up in the mornings, just being so tired. And then, yeah, the kind of the year was just like, kind of fooled with with dns i think it was kind of the first year i'd kind of really so kind that of stress had sort of DNF. accumulated you had this aggregate fatigue from 2014 even though it was a high flying highly successful year eventually exactly. there's consequences for that yeah and then like to be honest by the time 2015 came i thought like i was like in, in my head i was like cool I'm, I'm done like i've had a good couple of years in the in in in, in the sport like this is this is it. I remember dropping out of West, uh, not Western States, out of um, UTMB, um, and yeah, just thinking, cool, this that this was it. And uh, I remember coming back to back home to to South Africa, and I actually literally, I was just like, cool, this is this is it. And I just like stopped running completely, and I just um, I think I took like two weeks off, and then I just started running like when I felt like it. If I felt like running for ten minutes, I would like if it was two hours, and then like it was pretty crazy, like. Oh, when I took all that that pressure off my, myself, like everything turned around and like my bloods improved again. Um, and yeah, I man- managed to cut a long story short, managed to, to bounce back again. But it was, I thought potentially that was the, the end. Um, and then I guess also after 2018, after doing the Great Himalaya Trail, definitely took me took me a while to bounce back from that. And, and, and to be honest, I don't know, like from a racing point of view, I don't know if I've ever bounced back to, to being completely the same athlete. I guess... I have, I have aged as well. There's some insanely fast young guys coming through yeah. in the, in, in, in the sport, but I definitely think that kind of little adventure through that, through the Himalayas took it, took it out of me as, as well. But really? I think like having said all that, like, like mentally it's, it's, it's kept me fresh. I needed to do that to, to stay in, in, in the sport. So sometimes I guess you got to, you got to kind of lose a bit on the, on the physical side to, to kind of keep the stoke and, and kind of keep going mentally. That's a good illustration of just chipping away and thinking that it was potentially over for you in 2015. If you would have thrown in the towel, then you wouldn't have a cougar trophy at at this point. (laughs) But, you know, you just mentioned, you know, getting older, you're in your forties now how have things changed for you as you've gotten older? Like in what ways have you had to evolve as an athlete to try and stay at a high level to compete with these young guns that we exactly. keep referencing? Yeah, it's getting, getting harder and harder. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's like kind of looking for the, for the small gains. Um, and, um, yeah, just doing lots of reading. I think like I love like the the era of of the podcast now. I listen I listen to a lot of a lot of podcasts. Obviously, listen to um, like all your podcasts, like your 
coach Jason Coop's podcast I really enjoy. And I think it's cool that you can pick up like lots of little small things um, and just kind of keep applying them. Um, but I think like the big thing for me now is just to kind of keep the keep the mental stoke. Like you, you mentioned kind of probably it's UTMB and Hard Rock are the two races you want to have another crack at. Um, it's definitely for, for me, those are the two, the two races that kind of really excite me and, and, and motivate me. And um, going back to kind of UTMB this year, um, geez, I've had so many goes. I've got to, I've got to, got to get it, get it right. I still got to make it all, all the way around the, the mountain. Um, I said, this is a year of, of two loops. So um, I've done the loop around this year too. <laughs> now you have a much just, shorter loop around Mont Blanc. So <laughs> pressure's off. Let's talk about UTMB because this has been the ultimate unsolved riddle in your career. Yeah. You just haven't been able to figure it out, but admirably have continued to, to, to try. What are your feelings about that race? And have you figured out why a good performance has eluded you to this point? I think like I've had a certain amount of, of bad luck there. Um, just in terms of the first time I ran, it was actually 2015 with the, the glandular fever. So mm -hmm. I was definitely sub subpar. Um, and then I've had like stomach issues there before, but like, I also kind of sometimes feel like, like maybe mentally I just psyched myself out before the race being completely honest. Like, I don't know, like keep having like these setbacks. What do you mean with like, like self doubt or setbacks? Like, I think it's twofold. I think it's definitely times I've put like too much pressure on myself, maybe going in, into the race. And I think the like UTMB over the past five years, has just kind of just grown and, and evolved. Um, and I think it's, it's gone from being like, maybe when we first started like being one of the biggest races to now it's like head and shoulders, the, yeah. the biggest trail event in, 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 in the world. And I think kind of every time I've had a setback there, you kind of, go back and kind of maybe it, like I put more pressure on, on myself to, to kind of go out there and get a good performance. It's definitely the race I've in some ways invested a lot in kind of going out there beforehand to, to train. Um, so it, it's such, it's such a hard one. Like I've, I've thought long and hard and, and like thought like I have had bad luck, but I also sometimes feel that um, I've just put too much pressure on, on myself. The race does go out extremely hard. Um, and to be honest, that isn't it's not your my, style. Yeah. No. So maybe I've, I forced it a bit, a bit too much early on. Like, I don't know. It's, yeah, it, it's so hard to, to put my finger on it. Um, I had like the last time I had like issue, like I had issues twice with, with poles there. Um, what do you mean? Then again, like with like, uh, feeling comfortable using them or with mechanical difficulties? Yeah, so I've battled with my shoulder and it kind of goes into to my neck with with poles. Um so there's this last year I had that um issue um just when I was like all the training and stuff back home was fine, but then I went out to, to UTMB or to Chamonix like three weeks beforehand and just did a ton of vert and stuff. And in South Africa, you can't get like as big climbs and as kind of consistently kind of that that kind of gradient. So I think I just completely overloaded my shoulders and I went into my neck and I was kind of getting migraines and blurry vision and just mm. couldn't, couldn't shake it. Um, I kind of got a good support team back home, like a good, good chiropractor and, and stuff and, um, and get line of therapy. And when I came back home, I managed to kind of shake it quite, quite quickly, but I think, um, yeah, that um, kind of threw me, threw me out there. Like I think I got to, but 40, 50 Ks. And, um, as I was getting, getting dark, started getting blurry vision as well and, and headaches. So, um, yeah, that was, that was the end of yeah, my because, like, race. Man, you've had like so much success in your career, but like just the opposite of success at UTMB. Like I think yeah. a couple times you've dropped like very early in the race. So I was, yeah, I was, I, was, I, was, I was about to say that I haven't even been Made it to call my year yet. Um, really? <laughs> I think the, the majority, the majority of the laugh. time, it's just, just, yeah, no, I, I laugh as well. Now, like, it's, I make it just, just, just past the quantum means. Um, yeah. I, th I think the one time I've got the kind of little town on, on the other, other side of, of the hill before you kind of, um, piece of forgot now. But yeah, I, th I, th I think my, my best at, at UTMB is like 55K. So yeah, yeah. it's not a. Le Chapeau or whatever. Yeah. Um, so 
I mean, you keep investing in it. I love how you said that. I mean, like you've invested so much in it and, uh, for an athlete like yourself, yeah, there's only a few more things on your bucket list and a few things that have eluded you to this point in your career. And UTMB is the crown jewel. It is the Super Bowl. And uh, you're returning in August, admirably continuing to try. What uh, what do you plan to change uh, leading up to the race this year? Is there anything tactical that you're doing to keep the pressure off yourself and to set yourself up for more success? Or do I you need like, to core my air? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I think like just I think I'll be a lot, lot more chilled going into this, this, this race. Uh, or hopefully, I, th- I think it's always easy to talk about it now and I'll be like, oh, I'll be super, super chilled. And then suddenly it gets to race week and you're starting in the in in the start line of, of UT, UTMB and and things change. It's like a lot of energy and hype and a lot of a lot of nerves. But I definitely. Yeah, it's hard because I, I said the same thing last year. I was like, whatever happens, whether I've got to like hike it out, like I'm going to get, I'm going to make it, make it around whether I have to kind of just kind of gut it out to, to finish, like I've got to finish this damn race. So, and yeah, unfortunately that didn't, didn't happen. So that, that's definitely my kind of mindset this year. Like I'd like to, to have a good, good race, but I think it's like finish at all, at all costs. Like I've kind of got it, I've got to get it um, right now. And I guess also, yeah, I guess there's a bit more pressure with the, I know with kind of the the point system and stuff, you've got to do more races now to to be able to, as an elite to get into UTMB. So this could potentially be my kind of last crack kind of, or I guess kind of having an easy, an easy way in. Like if if I want to still race it again like the following year, then I guess you kind of gotta do gotta do more races and and yeah, could could be a bit more complicated. What do you think is your biggest weakness right now as an athlete? Is it the mountain type stuff using poles and steep ups and downs? Yeah, it's biggest week, maybe the downhills. I think like the, the, the kind of UTMB, like if the technical long downhills, it's fine. Like kind of grand raid and stuff. It's, it's mm. fine. Cause we get a lot of that in, in South Africa, even the Drakensberg, it's more technical, but those like UTMB, those like long, just runnable downhills where you can just send it. Those just kind of smash my legs uh, quite a bit. Um, so I definitely think, that is a is a weakness and maybe like going back to to UTMB maybe the times where like I haven't been like conditioned enough for for those conditions like you know it's it's quite a quite a specific type of of of, of training yeah what do you view as your biggest mistake in your career like if you were to point a younger athlete towards something that you'd done in your career to give them an example of something they shouldn't do what would you point towards Jeez, I, sh- I shouldn't have taken so long to to finish UTMB. It's getting a it's getting a lot a lot, a lot harder now with all the all the youngsters coming coming through. Uh, um, yeah, I think like looking looking back, I haven't got like too many regrets. Um, it would probably be one or two of my like DNFs. Um, I think like yeah, um, I was. F- yeah, I feel like maybe I should have just kind of gutted it out and done done whatever possible to to finish a race and just to to kind of respect the the race. But like, mm. yeah, th- thinking about it, like, I don't think I've got too many regrets for me. I think like if I had to give it like a youngster advice, I, I, I would say like always just go out and follow your your gut and and try things. Rather rather fail hopelessly than kind of look back one day and think like oh what what happens if if mm-hmm. if, if I tried that? Um, I think that's like really important uh, not to kind of like over guard yourself and maybe not say like oh, this is my strength like only focus on on that it's it's cool to to try and do a whole bunch of different things but I guess having said that the sport is like evolving and I think the guys that kind of are performing at, at the top level are being quite specific with kind of their races they are choosing and kind of focusing on 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 their their strengths love it so let's move towards Lesotho. I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about this crazy adventure. Maybe as we get into this subject, let's first start with Reno. Obviously, he's a longtime friend and expedition partner of yours. Talk about him. Maybe give a brief summary of what you guys have done together, your relationship, and how you guys you know work together on these massive projects. 
Yeah, so Serena comes more from an adventure racing background. Did a lot of lot of climbing when he was he was younger. So um, really good at at navigation. Something I'm I'm terrible at. Um, and I guess we like quite we quite the opposites. Like he's super OCD. Like everything's ordered. Like I just like don't know where where half my my stuff is half of the time. <laughs> like half the time I'm probably kind of leaving leaving stuff. He's he he's got it got to help out. But I think like we somehow seemed to gel really well. Um, and the first time I actually did something with Rainer was the, the Drakensberg Traverse in, in 2014. Um, and yeah, that was, that was quite a wild adventure together. Um, and I just think kind of the highs and lows you, you go th- through with something like that. Um, we became really good, good friends afterwards, um, kind of just outside of just kind of doing adventures or e- expeditions together. Um, yeah, and, and after that, he kind of came through like to Western States a few times and, and paced me. He's been out at um, UTMB as as well, uh, beat to a couple a couple of my races, um, and then it was your yeah, paced you the year State. you won Western States, didn't he? Yeah, and it was actually like at a vital vital stage. Like he, I only had a pacer from Greengate onwards. Um, he just paced me to to the bridge, but it was like at a, at a, at a crucial point, he knew me well enough where he could kind of push me enough, but without kind of pushing me over the, o- mm-hmm. over the edge. So like, I think that was like a kind of, yeah, for me, it was absolutely like vital to, to have him there. Um, but yeah, it was kind of after 2017 Western States. So we kind of decided to do the, the great Malaya trail. Um, and that was yeah, quite a, quite an epic adventure for both of us and uh, for him. Rainer got frostbite, suffered a couple of injuries. Um, I still don't know to this day how the hell he he got through it. Um, I think if, if it was me, I would have thrown in the towel a long time a, really? ago, or kind of pretty pretty early on in that. Like, yeah, there, there were kind of days where I just thought, like, this, this guy's not gonna not gonna make it through this. Um, and then yeah, we got got through the Great Himalaya Trail together, and then yeah, decided to do uh, the circumnavigation of of Lesotho now. Um, which yeah, like I say, like um, I guess I come from more the the running background, but like Rainer's navigation planning, I remember kind of telling me the the one weekend or kind of over a long weekend, he did like sixty hours of work on on maps for for the Lesotho <laughs> project, just because there are no trails, so he was kind of plotting uh-huh. stuff on Google Google Earth, and um, so yeah, I think kind of opposites sometimes attract, and and we kind of really kind of gel really really well together. Yeah. I don't know Reno well, but just sort of the couple of times I've spoken to him and through observing his and your social media and you guys working together, he seems like a great partner to have. And yeah, it is great to have those contrasting personalities. Sometimes it makes for great teammates. I remember speaking to you after the great Himalayan trail and also to speaking to Dean Leslie, who was out there documenting the project. And I know it was like a, fairly traumatizing adventure yeah. <laughs> and your last sort of multi-day expedition. Um, it seems like maybe you took a few years off to let those memories fade a little bit. So how did the idea for Navigate Lesotho begin? Where was the seed planted and uh, whose idea was it? Yeah, just going, going back to him and Les, actually like Dean, Rain and I, um, actually did like a podcast it was like a month or, or so ago and it was actually the first time we had we had like sat down and like properly had like a, a debrief on on um himalayas and it was it was like like a three-hour conversation uh but it was like yeah it was kind of like therapy for all of us like kind of, yeah. four years later whatever. yeah it was like no it was yeah, like proper like dean was telling me stories about them about them maybe crashing in in um airplanes and stuff i'd never heard half the stuff before i was telling dean stories like he he'd never heard stuff so oh, i gotta listen to this <laughs> yeah it was 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 pretty wild um yeah i guess navigate the so actually in, in between that this um i had an idea to run the skeleton coast which is the kind of wild coast along the namibian border which is the country just above mm-hmm. south africa kind of very long story short um i started but um yeah, I kind of uh, ran into some like political issues with, with seal clubbing and, and kind of got detained and kind of, yeah, kind of one, one thing led to another, but that was the, the end of the, the, the project. Um, oh. 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty. Yeah, it was 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 pretty uh, gnarly. Like Dean was out there filming. Uh, we still joke about it because he was like, "How hard can this be? You keep the ocean to your left, and you keep the the sand to your right, and you just you just run, and then like, and just yeah, don't get arrested." Of, yeah, and also like I, I blame Dean for for a lot of the, the stuff because so I was like running through and like I saw like all this like um, like terrible like I'm obviously very against it like the, the seal clubbing. Um, running through and then like these guys were like shouting at, at me and, and Dean was like, whenever anything goes down, just make sure you're rolling the GoPro. Um, so these guys were shouting me and then I pulled out the GoPro and started filming and that just like it es- escalated oh, no. very <laughs> <laughs> stupidly. It es- escalated. And I thought, cool, like now it's time just to turn around and, and kind of run away. And then I did that for about 20 meters and realized the guys weren't like, yeah, I wasn't going to be able to out, outrun like 30, 30 dudes. So, um, yeah, cut a cut a cut long long story short, that was kind of the end of the, the project. Got detained, like had to ask for a lot of lot of forgiveness. Um, but yeah, got got out of there in in one piece. Um, and it was actually yeah, a good a good friend of mine, Adrian Safi. Um, he had the idea of circumnavigating the Sutu, but he wanted he he wanted to do it like multi multi sports, so kind of running, riding, uh, trying to kind of pack off some of the the rivers, etc. And he was like, no, I'm getting too old to do this. Like, it'll be awesome to do it. You should like give it a bash. And I was like, it was just after Skeleton Coast. I was like, no, I'm done. I'm done with these. these yeah, projects, and after these the Great Himalayan Trail, which was a yeah. defying adventure also. I was like, no, like Vanessa, my wife's never going to let me do anything else. And then, <laughs> yeah, I guess he kept kept bugging me. And then I was like, maybe this is pretty cool. Cool. I spoke to Dean. He's like, wow, that'll be like an epic adventure. And spoke to to Raina, kind of got his his input, and he was like, "Jesus, this will be be really cool." And yeah, b- before I knew it, we kind of started started plotting the <laughs> the route. And I guess well, that was about like eighteen months to to two years ago. Um, spoke to to Red Bull again, like I said, I had this this idea, and you know, like working with with Red Bull, the guys were like super fired up. I was like, "This is awesome, let's make it happen." And uh, yeah, before I, before I knew it, we were lining up um at telly bridge the border border post uh and on, on the sutu and and starting this uh 1100k um adventure yeah all right well let's go into that in a sec but while we're talking about dean maybe we should just maybe flag who he is for the audience who isn't familiar dean leslie from the wandering fever formerly african attachment and there was uh an era of the sport where dean and dean's content really was very important to telling the story and he has such a talent for artistic storytelling and you guys have had a great friendship and he's been there to document so many of your adventures and between the two of you guys and you know some others you've have this sort of South African influence on the sport so if you want to meditate on that a little bit I'd love to open the floor to just sort of the South African pride and uh you know maybe what dean has meant in your career yeah so like you you said with dean i've actually known dean from i was at school with dean from like as early as as i i can remember so it's like been really really cool to to have dean involved in in the sport and i guess like at, at university i was like pretty wild enjoyed a party a good party life lots of lots of drinking i was in indonesia with with dean like had some crazy parties and then yeah, I guess like Dean went into like filmmaking Um, I started studying at university and kind of, we didn't see each other that much for like a year or two. And then I remember like kind of a cross, a, um, paths crossed and I was like, told Dean, yeah, I'm going to go, I'm heading off to the Gobi to do this race and uh, it's 250 kilometer race. And he was like, like, what the hell? Like what's, what's, what's got into you? And then, um, yeah, I did did that 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 race and kind of went went really really well and kind of started really getting in, in, into the, the sport and did a couple of other um, races and then um, he was like, "Flip, I've, I've got to come out and, and film one of these races." So he came to to racing the planet Namibia and and filmed that and we started making a docky actually called Wandering uh, Fever um, 
Did that ever come then, out? It feels no, like it's still, it, still, <laughs> you got, you got too, too busy with the, all the all the Salomon stuff after that. Soon no, I think it'd be like a hundred part documentary on Netflix, basically. But that's so cool, yeah, exactly. man. So he was just sort of like a uh, you know a, a new filmmaker in search of a story, and your guys' friendship blossomed into this perfect uh, you know perfect thing to sort of storytell around. Yeah, I think it was like really cool. Like with Dean, um, yeah, I remember like he came out to Namibia and then obviously was uh, Greg Volley joined Salomon and kind of Salomon formed the team. And then Dean spoke to Greg and said, can I like tag along and I'll make a couple of videos in in, in return. And that's really where kind of Salomon. Salomon TV, running TV like, and that yeah, took that, off. I mean, that was yeah. critically important for the maturation of the sport in sort of the sure. core years of our careers. For sure. So yeah, that was like huge. And I think just having like Dean, as I say, he's documented most of my adventures, big races. It's always been awesome to to have him there. And like you say, I kind of always feel like kind of having this South African contingent, obviously having Greg Fell there as well in the in, in the early days and, mm-hmm. and, and a number of the guys. So yeah, it was was really yeah, it's been been really cool. And I think like had a massive impact on my career in a, in, a, in a positive way and definitely kind of I guess kind of yeah, kind of given me a, like a lot of a lot of confidence at, at races having having Dean there and just that kind of South African camaraderie. Yeah, he's such a great guy. Say hello to him for me. So That's sort of back to your guys's missions that you've been on. Actually, it's funny. I remember <laughs> I remember him telling me that his partner after the Great Himalayan Trail quit like <laughs> somebody who was working for him to help create this film was just so overcome by the trauma of the great Himalayan trail uh project that he felt like he needed to leave the <laughs> leave the business of filmmaking entirely because it was so crazy so um it was, it was a wild one yeah so so back to Lesotho. Um, maybe you mentioned earlier, but just just give a quick uh, description of what Lesotho is for you know a mostly American listenership. Um, you know where it is and what makes it special, and why you guys decided on this as your objective. Yeah, so Lesotho is basically a landlocked country within South Africa, and it's where all the big big mountains are, the the Drakensberg Mountains. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the kingdom of the the mountains. Uh, that's what it's it's called. And so, kind of our idea was to circum, or kind of what you did was a circumnavigation of Lesotho. And it's I want to call it like a like a project of two halves. In terms of the first six hundred kilometers, were really like big mountains, no trails, very technical, um, like super remote. And then the the final five hundred kilometers. On the western side, you kind of drop down and you run through a lot of farmlands and a lot of little villages, a lot more runnable. Um, but like I said, like the problem is we didn't kind of take into account that it wasn't going to stop raining in, in Lesotho since um, December. So we actually on the western side had to kind of change our, our route slightly in places because just there were certain rivers like 100 meters wide that we just couldn't couldn't cross. We're nearly going to kind of cross one or two rivers. Um, and I'm pretty pretty glad we didn't because the rivers were just raging and we were just going to kind of jump in and just hope for the, hope hope for for the best. God. Yeah, so, yeah, no, that would have ended in, in in disaster. And even just like running through these farmlands, you're kind of just running in knee-deep bog and mud. Um, so that was, yeah, uh, pretty rough. So we had to change the route slightly just to try and get on a little bit more kind of hard-packed trails and and kind of farm roads. So but, you just mentioned that it's sort of split into two sections, the first 600 K in the last 500 K or so. And, uh, the first part is much more mountainous. So maybe let's sort of break those two things up and first talk about the, the first 600 K is when you're up in the high mountains, it seemed like, you know, the weather was uncooperative. As you mentioned, there's no trails and there was a, I know at least some, you know, backtracking due to safety considerations. So maybe provide the highlights and the lowlights of those first six or seven days, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah. So kind of, we started, started off, we actually had to delay the start by a day just because of, of, of the weather. Um, and we were like kind of in, in two minds, but also because it was so remote, um, we had, um, 
kind of guys on, on horseback uh, join us for certain sections um, just from a safety point of view. Um, and it wasn't going to be safe for the horses to, to go up in that, in those conditions. So we delayed it by a day and um, kind of started, but then the kind of weather was pretty iffy anyway. Um, yeah. So the first, the first couple of days, the weather was just kind of, it just rained um, really cold and, and, and windy conditions were, were tough. Um, but it kind of like, so the first 300 kilometers were kind of the mountains were about like two to like just under 3000 meters in height. But then like from day six or seven, we went into like the really kind of high Drakensberg mountains, which is all above 3000 meters. You've got some three and a half thousand meter peaks um, and kind of climbing up there, the weather really turned um, and there was a big cold front coming in. Um, and we got on top and it was snowing and it was just like really bad the day before every, like we got so soaked, everything got soaked. I had to borrow one of the, the guys on horseback had a, had a spare jacket. Um, I had to borrow one of those cause like everything was just soaked. I, I kind of freaked out quite a bit the, the night before just because like I was getting so cold and I just felt like I couldn't move quick enough. Um, it was misty. We were battling with nav and stuff. And I was like, really like, I started kind of feeling a bit like Himalayas, like where like this was like touch and go of anything. Getting out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Like one, one wrong thing you kind of roll an ankle or anything. And, um, it's a problem. You're in ser- yeah. You're in serious, serious trouble. So yeah, the, the night before I was feeling pretty uneasy and then we went up and also just because as I mentioned, like there were a lot of the route was no trails and stuff. The horses actually had to take a wider route around and take a less technical route. Um, and Rain and I got on top, but it was just freezing cold because we'd kind of cl- climbed up and height. You could suddenly feel the temperature had like dropped massively. It was starting to snow. We were both cold and kind of looked down and I could see where the horses were and they were like miles away, um, kind of trying to make their way around. And that's when I realized we had to get to Sani Pass by that night. That was the only place where we could we would be able to to uh, camp, and that was still forty kilometers away. And I realized we w- we weren't going to make it um, mm-hmm. by nightfall. And I just thought, like, yeah, I, I guess like having the the guys on on horse there that they weren't going to say, "Cool, we we pulling the the plug." It was obviously Rainer, my project. They wanted to to help as much as possible. And I just felt a certain responsibility from from like that that point of view i didn't want any of the horses or anyone to to get injured um and also just felt with with us uh like thing, it was just getting getting stupid so made this decision to turn around had to kind of get out that garmin in reach and and radio the the guys on on the horse because they couldn't couldn't hear and just said like let's let's backtrack and and meet where we left off and um yeah it was definitely like a low light because i guess to be honest i thought maybe that was the end of the the project Kind of, I didn't know know what was going to happen after that. It was like, I think it was like forty k's of of backtracking to come off the mountain. Wow. It sucks to kind of. So it probably add of, adds like a day or a day and a half to the overall. Expert. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so like it added a day. We got down and saw that the weather wasn't going to be great for the next two days. So kind of spoke to to everyone and, and and we decided just to kind of wait a day and then see if we could kind of get get going the following day which luckily luckily we did and got up onto the mountain into the high mountains and um she's i'm very glad we did backtrack like when i was backtracking at the time you always like kind of doubt yourself like kind of i don't know am i just getting old am i being a pussy do i need to just like kind of <laughs> yeah. suck it suck it up um <laughs> But yeah, going back onto the mountain, just like seeing how much snow was up there, I was just like flipped. That was a that was a good good call. So yeah, we had to still then do the 200 kilometers of the high mountains, which is a lot of the Drakensberg Traverse route. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of snow, so it was very slow going. But um, yeah, we managed to to kind of get off the the high mountains. I think it took us like yeah, it was on day 11 we got off. Um, day 11 in total, including the kind of one one kind of rest day or kind of day basically the first half took you 11 days and the second half took you like five days yeah it was yeah saying like it was just like yeah i said super slow moving a a lot of the altitude was there um and coming off the mountain like we were properly like beat up like my achilles my feet everything was just like trashed kind of your feet are just wet 20 24 7 so yeah yeah i think yeah coming off, 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 off the mountain um it was really really cool to like see more support after that on, on on the western side we actually had like 
guys could we could see guys every 10 to 20 kilometers and that made a big difference just also having kind of more uh yeah just 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 support people to to chat to could eat more more food um it definitely helped but having said that like the western side was still a challenge um with the river crossings um i guess like i think like with all adventures i've done you always think like you're on top of things and then like shit just happens and you're just like <laughs> yeah. how did how did this happen like <laughs> right. that was the feeling i got from following along on instagram and yeah in one of your updates you said that you and reyna were probably the first people ever to cover the 650 kilometer stretch through the mountains in sort of a single push which is yeah. i'm sure something that brings you a lot of pride and when you came out of that section you probably thought you were home free so maybe let's exactly recount any highlights or lowlights from the second half of the run that was theoretically supposed to be easier but ultimately turned out to be another <laughs> sloppy challenging mess it seemed like She's yeah, I think coming out out of the mountains, like she's like I'm not going back to the Drakensberg big mountains for a, for a very long time, maybe, <laughs> maybe never. Um, but yeah, I, I guess like you say, we got off the mountains, and I guess it's almost like I don't want to say like I think like kind of we thought the hardest part was over. We definitely thought like kind of we'd gotten through the worst, and then yeah, you just start hitting hitting these kind of farmlands and like like you're just running through bog stuff's flooded um navigation super super hard and i think it was like the third day or like the middle we were like cool like we actually had a really good day covered a lot of distance the vehicles had driven like around to meet us in uh, about five miles time and we just had like five miles to go and we'd actually covered two miles or three miles to go right and i was like like we we're like kind of like high-fiving like flip we've had an awesome day and then the next next minute we just kind of dropped down and we just see this river. It was like 120 meters wide or hundred meters wide. And just like, <laughs> what the, what the hell is going on here? Like we passed this little village just before, like it was sitting like on the river that like, or when I say little village, there were like four or five houses, like a little farming community, there were these four or five kids that started like running with us, following with us. And just like, they kept like asking, are you going to swim? Are you going to swim? And they like had these big, big smiles. Um, and we got to the river and like, we were trying to figure it out and then we decided walk up the river um, and we're going to jump in and like, we'll just kind of get dragged down a couple hundred meters and we'll try and get out. Um, and like we are, we had our jackets around us. We we're about to jump in and then Rain, I was like, no, like this is, this is stupid. Um, so yeah, again, we had to kind of get in touch with our support crew. They had to drive all the way around. We had to kind of reroute and replan. And again, that set us back like half a day just with kind of planning and taking a, a longer route. But yeah, there were a couple of situations like that, but luckily after that, that river, we kind of realized that, um, yeah, trying to stick to the original route probably wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna work, or at least we probably still would have, would have been there now yeah, if, yeah. if we'd done that. So ultimately you finished in 16 and a half days or something like that. Yeah. Any, uh, big learnings or takeaways from this project that were unique to some of the other things like the skeleton coast and the great Himalayan trail and the Drakensberg traverse, these other multi-day adventures that you've been on any, uh, you know, Take bigger off. takeaways we haven't talked about yet. No, I think like before the project is actually, and maybe it's something I can take into, into UTMB. I actually like we did one or two recce's and, and the recce's were quite gnarly I'd one or two like nearly got mauled by some local dogs up on top of the the mountain because because they've got like a lot of like basically the the Drakensberg on top of the mountains they they farm cattle and sheep and and um and there's a big problem with stock theft so the guys have like pretty mm. hectic dogs up there oh, but like exactly. packs of dogs like basically wolves and we were running on a recce the one day running around and the next next minute they had these ten kind of basically wolves on me like massive things and wow. um for all the kind of discomfort and, and the pain the poles have have caused me in the past like they definitely came to my savior yeah. there i was literally just like flinging my arms like yeah. it felt like for for an hour and luckily that the herdman came out he was laughing called these dogs and kind of the, the dogs backtracked and like but it was it was touch and go but like so kind of going in, in, into the project like mentally i was like weird i just couldn't like see the finish or visualize the finish um and that like freaked me out for a for a bit and i was like two or three months I even spoke to to red mm -hmm. bull about it and then yeah i listened to like a lot of podcasts and a lot of visualization to like 
work my kind of or just kind of kind of work huh. my way around the different kind of yeah kind of issues I felt I had had mentally and, and definitely kind of turn things around and I think just like thinking like kind of asked me like what has gone wrong at at, at UTMB and it's 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 weird I'd, sometimes I'd, I just don't like I can't yeah, visualize myself like running back into into Chamonix it's just like this is it man this is yeah, it so, so maybe it's yeah maybe maybe that's it and I, I think like not going off off point here but it was weird like before like some of my big big race wins are like I've almost like visualized it like clearly like I was gonna win like 20 2017 oh. I actually like as weird like I felt like I was gonna like kind of pull this this, this off I remember sitting with with Dean and and, and Jared um Dean from Wondering Fever that the night before mm-hmm. Western States 2017 was sitting around a a fire brying or having a, a barbecue um and yeah I was just like I could just like visualize kind of you just running. had an intuition that you were yeah running. yeah yeah um so I, I think like uh like that so like going back to to Lesotho that freaked me out a bit but luckily kind of yeah I kind of managed to to kind of wrap my head around that and and, and figure it out that's funny man I mean this is something I've talked about on the podcast quite a bit but that internal intuition have you always had yeah. an instinct of like when you're ready and when you're not like when things are going to go well and when they're not for sure it's even like making big decisions like that decision say turning turning back in in, in the mountains or kind of with the river yeah i've learned a lot to listen to my gut and maybe you kind of asked me a, a kind of few minutes ago like what advice would i give what mistakes have i made and maybe it's at times not listening to my gut and Sometimes it's it's hard because you kind of got those pressures. Like you'll know you wanna you wanna go and perform. Maybe it's like I guess with you last year, kind of going to to Grand Raid. And exactly. Yeah. Probably my knew was like, dude, what, you're not yeah. ready for this race. But my flight was booked, and I was using it as sort of a celebration of a transition yeah. in my life. And I mean, ultimately, 100%. and and there's been a few other things in my life, including very recently, where intuition has been very solidly and you know, in one side of a particular decision that I needed to make. And it took me forever to just align myself with my own intuition. And it's something that Harmony and I talk about nearly daily at this point is like, what does your intuition feel like for different things that we've got going on in our lives and decisions that we want to make? So important. So maybe as we start to wind down, I'd love to get your comments on thoughts on the current state of the sport internationally we've both been in the game for a long time so i'd love to hear sort of what you're excited about personally and also as it relates to the sport as a whole yeah i, th- I think it's really exciting and i think like as as we discussed the sports evolved so much and i guess like without beating around the bush i guess that the utmb series and, and utmb there's been a lot of a lot of criticism and there may be some things i'd I don't agree with, but I, I think like for the sport to to kind of professionalize and, and grow, I think we need a series like that. And I, I think it's exciting. Um I think the Ultra Shell World Tour was was great. Maybe it didn't quite work. Um I still like obviously you've got to see whether that kind of the UTMB series will work. But I think kind of what UTMB has done done for the sport, um, I think it's I think it's good and I think it's really exciting. And I like that they're also still, I think for like, if you look at someone like, like you and I, there's like, we still want to perform at UTMB, like kind of like the kind of the pinnacle um, of, of, of kind of professionalism of the sport. But then there's like that strong drive to, to do a race like hard rock, which is super, super competitive, but it's obviously the other spectrum when it comes to kind of being commercial Um and I think I think that's that that's cool. And I think what's great about the sport that in like all areas, um, there are those super kind of commercial events. But then if the guys that that's not for them, there's also there are there is like the less commercial, the kind of grassroots events, um, the FKTs, the the guys that like you don't have to to like a lot of guys that don't race that just love being in, 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 in the sport and just kind of getting out there and joining communities. So, yeah, I, I think the sport is in a, in a really healthy position. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to kind of see where it's going to go. And I, th- I think like, for like both of, both of us, maybe, um, 
from like a professional competition point of view, maybe we've only got a handful of races that we actually really want to want to do, or maybe, sorry, maybe I'm speaking for you. Maybe there's like a, like you like a lot more you, you want to do, but I I think the cool thing is like with, with, with free trail and kind of the, the sphere you headed in, um, I think there's, there's, there's great potential. Um, I think with, with me, I've kind of created, say back home concepts like 13 peaks, which is kind of a little, um, like more of a, a challenge, um, series and, and getting it involved with, um, Cape town trail marathon, setting up, up stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to, to kind of still stay in, 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 in the sport and kind of be a part of it and, and, and keep growing. Like I always say, like, I guess I'm not going to be competing professionally for forever but i but i hope that like one day when i'm 60 70 i can still be involved in in the sport somehow if it's not involved from a commercial point of view at least still like enjoying the the mountains and, and still kind of getting out there and, and kind of shuffling along or, or going for for a hike yeah. so yeah I'm, I'm i'm really excited so is that kind of on the personal front i don't know i mean like uh we're both closer to the end of our best years than to the beginning, unfortunately, <laughs> for being honest with ourselves, but we've been lucky to have amazing and fulfilling careers. And what do you want your impact to be long-term? I mean, obviously like you've written a book, you've got these events around Cape town, you've sort of single-handedly made South African trail running a thing. What do you want your impact to be when you sort of, wind down the professional racing part of your career yeah i think for me like creating the the concept 13 peaks in, in cape town kind of happened by by accident i kind of sandbag ken riley into into joining me for a for a long run and basically or kind of a little sketch i made in a, in a notepad and one thing led to another and it became a challenge but i, I think for for me just like having created that and getting the like listening to the people's feedback and how like like people for the first time have got into the mountains for that. Um, guys that have like been like, uh, trying to be cancer that have, have done 13 piece, just some of the, like the, the incredible stories that have come out of it, that like the human element stories. Um, it's just been like, so, so rewarding for me. Um, and I think for me, like I'd rather be remembered as the dude that kind of created 13 peaks than kind of someone who won Western States or kind of, Cool. Got five D- DNFs at, 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 at UTMB. And I think, I think for me, <laughs> I think the, the, the cool thing was, I it was about six months. So I was on, on the mountain and I was like, oh, there's, there's, there, there's Ryan Sands. He was the dude that, that, that started 13 peaks. And for me, that was like such a win. I was like, cool. Like if I could be like, like, you know, as I say, like racing and stuff has, has been a massive part of my life and I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, um, if it wasn't for that and, and some of the wins, but, um, like, I don't want to be like, remembered as that. I'd, I'd rather kind of be remembered as, as having a bigger impact on, 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 on the sport and, and kind of getting people in, involved in, in different ways and kind of now having an event Cape Town trail marathon, just standing on, 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 on the finish and, and kind of cheering people in. I, I think that's really, really rewarding. I know you also yeah, kind of getting into yeah doing that too the race directing role like it's it's yeah i think it's it's it's, it's really really cool uh to be able to give back like that yeah. awesome are you going to do anything before utmb i know you're just recovering from a 16 day expedition <laughs> right now but i know you want nothing more than to be in your best peak physical condition standing on that start line in chamonix in august what is the next what i guess only three and a half months look like until race day yeah actually i think it was today i actually just like on my training peaks put in like the utmb date and i saw it was 16 weeks or something i was like flip it doesn't 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 (laughs) give me a lot lot of of time time. to chill (laughs) no so to be honest like no no um kind of races are planned except for obviously wings wings for life world world yes this weekend weekend. so um but yeah i think i'll be doing five five or ten ten kilometers Um, Yeah. I'm going to San Francisco. I think we're running like seven K at 4 AM for the wings for life. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, that's early. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so no, 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 no plans. I, I guess it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. Cause like 
actually the last like race I did was uh Madeira Ultra Trail um at the end of of last year and like I was stoked like I finished and, and I've sorted out a lot of stuff with the poles but I wasn't like overly happy with my actual performance so <laughs> I guess like going into a race like UTMB it would nice be nice to to do a race and go into some confidence and also kind of get rid of that kind of race rust per se but I, I think um yeah, I think where I am now in, in in my career, I'd rather just focus on getting a solid block of of training and actually heading out to to Chamonix in June, July for four weeks. Um, Max, my son, has school holidays, so gonna go and um, head out there do do a bit of bit of training. And like I said, it's definitely kind of yeah, never say never, but I think it's gonna be my last like kind of proper proper role of of the dice um, for 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 UT, UTMB or kind of. Yeah, at least. So you got to make the finish line this year. You got to make it. Let's start the visualization practice. Exactly. I got to make the finish line so I can get it. Also, get get a qualifier for for Hard Rock. Yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. Because that's still on the bucket list. Well, bro, it's it's so fun to have you on the podcast. I mean, we've known each other for years, and ever since that Leadville 100 when you beat my ass, uh, but you know, we both walked away with proud finishes, and you know it sort of launched both of our careers in the direction that they ultimately took. You know, I've always looked up to you and always really appreciated what you bring to the sport. And I appreciate you coming on the show. So say hello to, to Vanessa for me and take care. And hopefully we'll see you this summer. Thanks so much. Y'all. Really, really cool chatting and, and, and likewise. And yeah, thanks so much for, for what you're doing for our sport.